Let me help you ace your pre-calculus unit one exam by doing a bunch of problems about expressions, exponents, equations, inequalities, and coordinate geometry. Problem number one says to expand the expressions, perform the indicated operations, and simplify. In this case, multiply binomials and then combine like terms. We have 2x minus 5 times x plus 4. It's the good old FOIL method. First times first, outside times outside, inside times inside, last times last. First times first is 2x times x is 2x squared. Outside times outside is 2x times 4 is plus 8x. Inside times inside is negative 5 times x is minus 5x. And last times last is negative 5 times 4. That's negative 20. Now combine these two like terms. 8x minus 5x is 3x. So the final answer is 2x squared plus 3x minus 20. What if your teacher asked you to explain why the FOIL method works? The key reason is called the distributive property, and you could reason it out this way. You could take the first binomial, 2x minus 5, and imagine distributing it through the second binomial. Take this entire thing, first multiply it by x, then multiply it by 4 and add the results. You could write that as 2x minus 5 times x plus 2x minus 5 times 4, and then you can use the distributive property two more times. Distribute the x through here, and distribute the 4 through here. We will get 2x squared minus 5x for the first one, and then plus 8x minus 20 for the second one. Once again, 8x minus 5x gives you 3x. We do get the exact same answer as before, and we use the distributive property. Part B takes the first part, 2x minus 5 times x plus 4, and multiplies times another factor. So to do this from scratch, you'd want to multiply these two things first, just like we did in part A. I'll go ahead and write the answer. That was 2x squared plus 3x minus 20. Now multiply by x minus 3. This is no longer a binomial. This is a trinomial. It's got three terms instead of two terms. However, in general, this distributive property still is going to work. And what that ultimately ends up meaning is we can, for example, take the x term over here and multiply times every term to get 2x cubed plus 3x squared minus 20x, and then go to the minus 3 and multiply it times every term. Again, I'm really using the distributive property here. When I do that, I'll put it under the previous line, and I'll line up like terms vertically. Negative 3 times 2x squared is minus 6x squared. Negative 3 times 3x is minus 9x. Putting the x squared terms lined up vertically and lining up the x terms vertically. Then negative 3 times negative 20 is positive 60. Add these things up vertically, combine the like terms, we get 2x cubed minus 3x squared minus 29x plus 60. That's the final answer for part B. Part C is to multiply a binomial times itself to the third power, meaning multiply with three factors. This is x minus 2 times x minus 2 times x minus 2. I'm going to show you two ways of doing this. The first way is going to be the same thing I did in parts A and B. I'll multiply these two binomials first with FOIL, and then I'll multiply a trinomial times a binomial. I'll also show you how to do this with something called Pascal's triangle. More efficiently, it's called the binomial theorem. Anyway, first times first here, looking at these two products here. x times x is x squared. Outside times outside is minus 2x. Inside times inside is another minus 2x. And then negative 2 times negative 2 is positive 4. Combine the like terms, we get x squared minus 4x plus 4. That's a trinomial times a binomial, x minus 2. Do the same thing I did in the previous problem. Take the x times everything, I get x cubed minus 4x squared plus 4. I took this x times each term here. Now do the same kind of thing with the minus 2. Negative 2 times x squared is minus 2x squared. Negative 2 times negative 4x is positive 8x. I forgot my x here. 
That's a mistake, but I fixed it. And then I have negative two times four is minus eight. Combine the like terms, we get x cubed minus six x squared plus 12 x minus eight. That is the final answer. What would the binomial theorem tell us to do? Based on something called Pascal's triangle, which is a triangle of numbers where you have ones along the outside diagonals that you see, and in the middle, on the third line, what you do is you put a number here that is the sum of the two numbers most directly above it. One plus one is two. Do the same kind of thing with two spots in the next row and then three spots in the next row. Right here, the number that goes here is one plus two, that's a three. The number that goes here is two plus one, that's also a three. We don't need it, but if we wanted to, we could continue that kind of pattern to get coefficients for higher and higher powers of binomials. In this case, we only need this particular line. This line gives us the coefficients of what we get when we take a plus b quantity cubed. We get one times a cubed times b to the zero power plus three times a squared times b to the first power. The coefficients come from the triangle. The powers are the pattern that you see. Start with the highest power of a and go down by one each time. Start with the lowest power of b and go up by one each time. That pattern continues. And we can certainly simplify this to just a cubed plus three a squared b plus three a b squared plus b cubed. Now use that here. What is a and what is b? a is x and b is negative two. So if I do that here, combine these ideas, what will I get? Again, I'm looking right here and I'm looking there, a is x and b is negative two. a cubed is x cubed plus three a squared times b, careful about signs, b is negative two, plus three a times b squared plus a cubed, uh, three, b cubed, which is negative two cubed, simplify. Three times negative two is minus six. Negative two squared is four times three is 12. And negative two cubed is minus eight. We get the exact same answer that we got before. Number two is about factoring, which is the reverse process of expanding. Parts A, B, and C are gonna be factoring quadratics, and then part D is going to be factoring a cubic expression. Here we have a quadratic. In general, factoring is very difficult and you can't always factor quadratics even over the real numbers because maybe you have complex number roots. So we're kind of just hoping that this works, some trial and error. We also could try to graph this quadratic. In fact, see that it's got some x-intercepts. I won't bother doing that here. Since the coefficient of x squared is one, it's one times x squared here, that's nice. That means we can have x in the first spots in both cases. And then it's a matter of choosing numbers here and here that multiply to get together to give you negative 40 and add to give you three. Because with foiling, the outside and inside terms are gonna combine to give you three x in this case. So you could try 40 and negative one or negative 40 and one. 20 and negative two or negative 20 and two, 10 and negative four or negative 10 and positive four. Trying all those things doesn't work because those numbers don't add to three. It's gonna be eight and negative five and not negative eight and five that multiply to negative 40 and add to three. Eight and negative five, there's the answer. We can always check it by foiling first times first, Outside times outside is minus five x. Inside times inside is positive eight x. And last times last is minus 40. These two to combine to give you three x. That does check the answer here. Part B is a little trickier. Four x squared minus four x minus 15. It's trickier because the coefficient of x squared is not one. So I have extra things to guess and check. It could be a 4x and an x, or a 2x and a 2x. Which one is it? Well, if you don't have a calculator, it's just a bunch of trial and error. If you do happen to have a calculator, you could plug the function into your graphing calculator and pick a certain window, hopefully fairly standard, and graph it. It's a quadratic, so it's gonna be a parabola. We're not seeing the whole graph, it goes down 
underneath what we see here. But most importantly, we do see there's two x-intercepts at negative 1.5 and positive 2.5. In other words, negative 3 halves and positive 5 halves. The fact that those fractions are dividing by 2 ultimately means we want to choose the 2x and the 2x because when we set those things equal to 0 and solve for x, we'll be dividing by 2. All right, we do want to pick numbers here and here that multiply together to give a negative 15. But in this case, they're not going to add together to give you negative 4 because of the 2s. You've got to try some things. You could try 5 and negative 3. If we want, when we multiply by 2x in each case, then to give you negative 4x, we better try minus 5 and plus, two, uh, plus, plus 3, excuse me. We can always check it by foiling. 2x times 2x is 4x squared. Outside times outside is 2x times 3 is plus 6x. Inside times inside is minus 10x. And last times last is negative 15. And yeah, this works. These two combine to give you negative 4x. We ultimately match what we were trying to factor. This is the answer. 2x minus 5 times 2x plus 3. And again, the x-intercepts for this function would be negative 3 halves, negative 1.5 from this one, and positive 5 halves, positive 2.5 from this one. Part C is a quadratic with no linear term, 36x squared minus 49. Now, once again, you could do some trial and error. But actually, in this case, it's good to recognize that this is 6x quantity squared, and this, minus 49, is minus 7 squared. This is the difference of two squares. Anytime you have the difference of two squares, it can be factored very easily. a squared minus b squared in general is a minus b times a plus b. That's definitely worth remembering. You can check this. You can foil it. a squared, a times a is first times first is a squared. Uh, outside times outside is plus a b. Inside times inside is minus AB, and last times last is minus B squared. Those cancel, simplifying to A squared minus B squared when you check it. This always works. So here, A is 6X and B is 7. So we get 6X minus 7 times 6X plus 7. You can check it by foiling. Do it in your head. You get 36X squared. You get plus 42X and a minus 42X, which cancel. Negative 7 times 7 is negative 49. That is the factorization. Part D looks really hard. 2x cubed, it's cubic, plus 8. And there's no squared terms and there's no x terms. You could try to graph it, look for roots, and maybe that would be helpful. But this is worth knowing here. This is the sum of two cubes. This is 3x quantity cubed plus 2 cubed. And like the difference of two squares, any time you have the sum, or in fact, even the difference of two cubes, you can factor it. With the sum of two cubes, this can be factored as a binomial times a trinomial. The binomial happens to be a plus b. The trinomial, this is a little tricky, is a squared minus ab, not, not minus 2ab, but minus ab, plus b squared. This is how you factor the sum of two cubes, or the sum of two cubes. If you want to check it, go ahead and do the same kind of thing we did on the first problem. Take the a, for example, and multiply it times every term to get this. Take the b and multiply it times every term and line up like terms. b times a squared goes under this term and will cancel with it when we add them b times negative ab is minus ab squared, and then b times b squared is plus b cubed. When we add those cancel right there and these cancel, you are left with a cubed plus b cubed. Applying that here with a equal to 3x and b equal to 2, we get a plus b is 3x plus 2. a squared is 9x squared minus ab is going to be minus 3x times 2 is minus 6x plus b squared is plus 2 squared, 4. There's a quadratic. In general, we might be able to factor it further. 
However, in this case you can't, and that can be checked with the quadratic formula. This is not going to be factor or factorable over the real numbers at least because it's going to have complex number solutions. If you set this equal to zero, solve for x with the quadratic formula, you get negative b, which is negative of negative 6, positive 6, plus or minus negative 6 squared is 36, minus 4 times 9, that's the a, times c, all over 2 times a, which is 2 times 9. And the key thing is this thing under the square root is going to be negative. 4 times 9 times 4, that's going to be 16 times 9, that's 144. 36 minus 144, the key thing about that is that is negative. Square root of a negative number is an imaginary number. When you combine with these things, you get what's called a complex number. This has no real solutions. This is not factorable over the real numbers, so this is the final answer if you're only after factoring over the real numbers. Number three says to simplify the following expressions. You can see in part A we have the a rational expression the ratio of two polynomials, that's called a rational function. In general, if you've got something like this, you probably can't simplify it unless you are quote unquote lucky. And in this case, we're lucky because we can factor the numerator and cancel with the denominator. x squared plus 7x plus 12 can be factored as x plus 4 times x plus 3. Divide that by x plus 4. And the factor of x plus 4 there can cancel with the factor of x plus 4 there, not to leave a 0, but to leave a 1. This simplifies to x plus 3. That would be the final answer. Now, technically, you should realize that if you were thinking of these expressions as defining functions of x, the original one is undefined when x is negative 4, while the final one is defined when x is equal to negative 4. And if you're going to think about graphing such things, technically speaking, the graph of this function is the same as the graph of this one, except this one has a hole in it. It's called a removable discontinuity. When x is negative 4, there's a point missing. What's the y-coordinate of the point? It would be negative 4 plus 3 is negative 1. I'll let you graph that if you like. The upshot of what you can write here is this is true as long as x is not equal to negative 4. Okay, that's actually important for calculus. Part b. We've got two rational functions that are being subtracted. All right, we're not adding or subtracting numbers here. We're adding or subtracting rational functions, but the idea is the same. You still want to get a common denominator. In this case, these two things need to be, uh, in general, multiplied. However, we can get away with a little bit of a trick here to realize x squared minus 4 is x minus 2 times x plus 2. So I actually don't have to multiply this fraction by the top and the bottom by x plus 2. It's already got a factor of x plus 2 in the bottom. The only thing I need to do is multiply this fraction by x minus 2 on both the top and the bottom. You have to do it to both the top and the bottom so that the expression does not is not changed in value, you might say. Value when you plug in a value of x. I want to get that common denominator of x squared minus 4. I need to multiply by x minus 2 on the bottom to, to do that. If I do it to the bottom, I also have to do it to the top. So this is just a big 1, and it doesn't, again, change the value of the expression. If I do that, I then have a common denominator of x squared minus 4. And what happens on the top? I have to expand x plus 1 times x minus 2 with FOIL. x times x is x squared. Outside times outside is minus 2x. Inside times inside is positive x. Those will combine to give you minus x. And then last times last is going to be minus 2. When you combine these, you now subtract the numerators. Careful to not make a mistake. I'm going to go ahead and subtract like this with parentheses. To remind myself, I now need to distribute the minus sign through the parentheses. And I will get some cancella cancellation here. This cancels with this. I'm left with x plus 2 over x squared minus 4. And in, amazingly, this is a coincidence, uh, this can be simplified further because, once again, we can go back and factor. And we can cancel, in this case, the x plus 2s. This all simplifies to 1 over x minus 2. That'll be the final simplified answer. Definitely unexpected looking at the original thing. Technically speaking, this equals this as long as x is not equal to negative 2. Neither one is defined when x is positive 2, but they're equal as long as x is not equal to negative 2.
part C. Whoa, we got fractions within fractions here. 1 over x minus 1 third, all over x minus 3. What should we do? There's a couple different ways you can think about this. One way to think about it is to multiply the top and the bottom of this entire big fraction by the common denominator on the top, 3x. If you do it to the top, you got to do it to the bottom so that you're just multiplying by 1. What's going to happen when you do that? Let's put the equal sign here. On the top, you've got to use the distributive property. Careful, 1 over x times 3x. The x is cancel, leaving you with 3. 1 third times 3x. The 3 is cancel, leaving you with minus x. On the bottom, if I distribute through, I get 3x squared minus 9x. Uh, on, does this simplify further? I can factor 3x out of the bottom, and I'm left with, when I do so, let's see, x minus 3. And this does simplify further because the top, 3 minus x, is the same as negative of x minus 3. And then those x minus 3's can cancel and you're left in the top with a negative 1 all over 3x. That's the simplified form of what you see here. And this is going to be true as whenever these are um, both defined. They're not defined at x equals 0. This one is defined at x equals 3, but this one's not. This is true equal as long as x is not equal to 3. What's another way this one could have been done? We could have... Uh, say written it as 1 over x minus 3 and then also times the top and I could have gotten the common denominator of 3x. 1 over x could be written as 3 over 3x and minus 1 third could be written as minus x over 3x. Subtract those fractions. They already have a common denominator to give you uh, 3 minus x over 3x. Keep that denominator the same. Uh, once again, the top here and the bottom there cancel, leaving you with a minus 1 and a 3x on the bottom. We do get the same final answer. The last part, part D, yikes, kind of nasty looking. We got a complicated expression different than these other ones. This is not really a rational function anymore because we have fractional powers, though it's possible it could simplify to something rational. There's a couple different ways you could go about trying to simplify this. You could first use a property of exponents right away to bring this 4 through everything, and then it's a matter of adding and or subtracting exponents appropriately. I'll go ahead and raise everything to the fourth power first. 3 to the fourth power is 81. x to the 1 third to the fourth power, you need to multiply the exponents. 1 third times 4 is 4 thirds. y to the negative 1 fourth to the fourth power, multiply the exponents and get y to the negative 1. Negative 1 fourth times 4 is negative 1. On the bottom, you need to raise everything to the fourth power as well. So again, multiply exponents. And then to simplify further, we would want to subtract exponents. For the x, we'd have 4 thirds minus 4 fifths. And for the y, we'd have negative 1 minus 4 thirds. We need to get a common denominator. In both cases, for the first case, for the power of x, you want a common denominator of 15. I'll multiply this one by 5 over 5, we'll get 20 fifteenths. Multiply this one by 3 over 3, we'll get minus 12 fifteenths. For the y, get a common denominator of 3, so we have negative 3 over 3 minus 4 over 3. Continue simplifying. Subtract the numerators, uh, 20 minus 12 is 8, so we get 8 fifteenths here. And Negative 3 minus 4 is negative 7, so we get negative 7 thirds there. That's maybe one simplified form of the answer, but maybe your teacher doesn't want you to have negative exponents, so then you could write it as 81x to the 8 fifteenths divided by y to the 7 thirds as well. It's another way to write the final answer. Number 4 says find all real number solutions of each equation. The first four parts are going to be quadratics. We're hoping that we can factor these things. x squared plus x minus 12 equals 0. Can that be factored? If we can't, we need to use the quadratic formula. This one can be factored. A little bit of experimentation reveals that we can factor the left side as x plus 4 times x minus 3. We're still setting that equal to 0 and trying to solve for x. If the product of two things is 0, then one or the other must be 0. This gives solutions x equals negative 4 and positive 3. 
should always double check them back in the original function. For example, negative 4 squared is positive 16, minus 4 is positive 12, minus 12 is 0. And when you plug in 3, you get 9 plus 3 is 12, minus 12 is 0. Those both do work. Part B, x squared minus 6x plus 9. Are we lucky again? Can we factor this? Yes, and it even factors in kind of a special way as x minus 3 times x minus 3. In this case, the, the constant term is positive. We haven't encountered that yet. So your choices here are going to be going to have to have the same sign, either plus 3 and a plus 3 or a minus 3 and a minus 3. You could also think about 9s and 1s. But they want them to add together to give you negative 6. We need to choose the minus ones. This is the same as minus 3 quantity square, x minus 3 quantity square equals 0. There's just one real solution, x equals 3. If you graph this as a function of x, its graph would be a parabola just touching the x-axis at one point instead of two points. Part C, 2x squared plus 4x plus 3. I'll just tell you, I'll cut to the chase. If you try factoring this, you will not be successful. We need to fall back on the quadratic formula. Negative 4 plus or minus square root of 4 squared is 16. Minus 4 times 2 times 3, all over 2 times 2. 2 times 2 is 4. Negative 4 over 4 is negative 1. We could also write a 1 fourth square root. Oh no, it's going to be a negative number under there. 4 times 2 times 3, that is going to be 24. 16 minus 24 is negative 8. Yikes, we have complex numbers. So you're, depending on what your teacher wants you to do, um, you could say there is no real solution. And in fact, in the directions here, we're after all real number solutions. So we would say no real solutions based on those directions. If you were after complex solutions, if your teacher allows you to find complex solutions, we could write this as negative 1 plus or minus 1 fourth uh, negative 8 could be thought of as negative 1 times 8. We could write this as square root of 8 times square root of negative 1. That could be replaced by the imaginary unit i. Square root of 8 can be written as 2 times square root of 2. So in simplified form, this would be negative 1 plus or minus 2 and the 4 cancel to leave square root of 2 over 2i if you allowed complex number solutions. But our directions are after real solutions, so we have no real solutions. Part D, once again, if you try factoring it, you will not be successful. Does this have complex number solutions as well? It turns out it's got real solutions, but they're not nice numbers. They are irrational numbers. This simplifies to negative 5 halves plus or minus, what do we have here? 25 ultimately plus 28, that's going to be 53. Square root of 53 over 2, yikes, not a nice number. That's not a perfect square. You could also write this as one fraction. You could also approximate it. Those are the real solutions. Those are real numbers. They're just not rational numbers, but they are perfectly valid real solutions, and their approximations could certainly be useful in practical problems. Part E is not a quadratic, at least on the surface. We've got two rational functions being set equal to each other, and we're trying to solve for x. You can cross multiply. In effect, when you cross multiply, what you're doing is, in this case, you'd be multiplying both sides by 2x and multiplying both sides by 2x minus 1. You can think of it more quickly as cross multiplication. x plus 1 times 2x minus 1 and x times 2x, these things are set equal to each other. And ultimately, we have a quadratic here. So continue simplifying. Foil this out. You'll get 2x squared minus x from outside times outside plus 2x from inside times inside gives you plus x. Last times last gives you minus 1. It only looked like a quadratic because those cancel. So we're left with x minus 1 equaling 0. So x is 1. We better check the answer. Right? Well, I circled it here, but we should check it. Plug in 1 on the left side, you get 2 over 2 is 1. Plug on the 1 on the right side, you get 1 over 2 minus 1 is 1 is 1 as well. x equals 1 does, in fact, work. But you really should double check things. And that tactically is necessary for a proof, you might say. 
oh, f doesn't look so pleasant. x minus 4 times square root of x equals 32. How do you deal with the square root? There's a couple different things you could try. One thing you could try is you could try subtracting 32 from both sides and think of x as square root of x quantity squared. We are thinking about real solutions here. x would not be allowed to be a negative number here. This would be the same as x. And then you've got minus 4 times square root of x and then minus 32 equaling 0. And this is a quadratic in the quantity square root of x. You could give it a different name if you like. Call it u or something. u squared minus 4u minus 32. And so we could try to factor or use the quadratic formula. And in fact, you can factor in this case. But now you're going to have square root of x's in the first spots. We want to multiply to negative 32 and add to negative 4. A minus 8 and a plus 4 is what we want. So we get square root of x minus 8 is 0. Square root of x is 8. Or square root of x is negative 4. Oh boy, that looks like a problem, right? We're not going to get a negative number because the square root symbol by definition means positive square root. Square both sides of this one, you get x squared is, or x itself is 8 squared is 64. Don't square both sides of this one, again, because there would be no real number x that gives you negative 4. It looks like x equals 64 might be the only solution. We should check it. Square root of 64 is 8. 4 times 8 is 32. 64 minus 32 is 32. That is a solution. Maybe you feel uncertain about whether it's the only solution. You could certainly graph this function of x and see that it crosses y equals 32 at just one point. It does. Is there any other way to solve it? Um, I think maybe you could solve this by isolating the square root on one side. We could write x minus 32 equals 4 square root of x. I added 4 square root of x to both sides and subtracted 32 from both sides. And then square both sides. Let's see, is this really going to work? Let's just see what happens. Uh, what's negative 32 times itself? Negative 32 squared is the same as 32 squared. That's 1,024 equals 16x when I square the other side. Is this going to work? Let's just see what happens. Subtract 16x from both sides. I get minus 80x and plus 1,024. Does this factor as x minus 64 squared or something like that? Let's just see what, well, OK, that doesn't seem like it's going to work. What does the quadratic formula give us? This is pretty interesting to see what happens here. Let's see, 80 squared, what's that, 6,400? Minus 4 times 1 times 1,024 would be minus 4,096. I don't know what's going to happen here. 40 plus or minus uh, 6,400 minus 4,096. I want to see what happens here. It's 2,304. Does that have a nice square root? I hope so, or else I made a mistake. 48 over 2 is 24. So these do give two real numbers, 64 and 16. But does 16 work? Uh, it doesn't work. This is bringing up a good point. Square root of 16 is 4. 4 times 4 is 16. 16 minus 16 is 0, not 32. 16 doesn't work. It's an extraneous solution. I wrote on my desk there. 64 works. What happened there? When you square both sides of equations like we did here and going from here to here, what happens is sometimes you introduce what are called extraneous solutions. Solutions of this equation that are not solutions of the original equation. You always have to check them. Number five says to rationalize in the manner indicated. Part A, rationalize the denominator. What does that mean? It means try to get rid of the square roots, in this case, in the bottom. The denominator is the bottom. Why would we want to do such a thing? It's because it's a useful skill for calculus, especially what are called limit problems in calculus. It's not because you can't have square roots in denominators. How do you do that? It's a little trick. It's based on the difference of two squares formula. c squared minus d squared, let's call it, we saw before, is c minus d times c plus d. If I think of this expression as being, say, a c minus d, if I multiply it by c plus d, the inside and outside terms from FOIL go away. They cancel. Go ahead and write it down. And go ahead and multiply that part right away in the bottom. First times first is a. Outside times outside is square root of a times square root of b. Inside times inside is negative square root of a times square root of b. Those cancel. 
last times last is minus b. That's what happened. Effectively, I used this formula here when I go ahead and FOIL these out. But I can't stop there. I, that would change the expression if I leave a 1 up top. I have to also multiply the top by the same expression, square root of a plus square root of b, so that I'm multiplying by a big 1. And when you multiply that by 1 on top there, you still have square roots. They don't go completely away. We've only gotten rid of the square roots in the denominator and not the numerator. It looks worse, but in some cases it's better. Part B is a little bit of a more common kind of application that you're going to see in limit problems and calculus. Rationalize the numerator. Try to get rid of the square roots in the numerator. Okay, do the same kind of trick. Multiply this thing by the first expression plus the second expression. And if you do it to the top, you've got to do it to the bottom. So that again, we're multiplying by a disguised form of 1, and this will get rid of the square roots in the top, the numerator. You get square root of x plus h times itself is just x plus h. Outside and inside terms from foiling cancel. This times this cancels with this times this. Last times last gives you minus x. The square roots do not go away in the, in the bottom. They are there. They have to stay there. This can be simplified further, however. The x's completely cancel. x minus x is 0, leaving you with an h. And then those h's can divide out. They can cancel. h divided by h is 1. So this ultimately simplifies to 1 over square root of x plus h minus square root of x. Excuse me, I made a mistake here. Plus instead of minus. And this is the final answer. And it turns out this is a more useful way to think about limit problems that come up in calculus when you let h go to 0. All right, part c is a fun looking problem. Look at the directions. They say square and then rationalize to find this number, crazy looking number. Hmm, I wonder if it turns out real simple when we follow the directions here. Let's see what happens. Well, first square it. In the bottom of this fraction, that's going to get rid of the outer square root. And in the top, I have to FOIL square root of 2 plus square root of 6 times itself when I square it. But again, in the bottom, it's just the outer square root that goes away. Expand out the top. The square roots are not going to go away. But I do get square root of 2 times square root of 2 is 2. Square root of 2 times square root of 6 is the same as square root of 12, and so is this one. So I really get 2 square root of 12 which can be simplified, but I'll leave it like that for the moment. Square root of 6 times itself is plus 6. Leave the bottom as is. And let's see, so 2 plus 6 is 8. Square root of 12 is square root of 3 times square root of 4, and square root of 4 is 2. 2 times 2 is 4. It looks like it's going to be 4 square root of 3. Doesn't look like this will necessarily turn out to be a nice number, but let's follow the directions. Rationalize the denominator now. The denominator is the bottom, so I want to multiply. Now there's a plus sign there. Well, I can put a minus sign here instead now. Let's, if I do it to the bottom, I got to do it to the top. This gets rid of square roots on the bottom. 2 times 2 is 4. Outside and inside terms cancel. Square root of 3 times minus, uh, negative square root of 3 is minus 3. Hey, 4 minus 3 is 1. That's nice. What happens on top? Do the square roots go away? I'm not sure. Foil it out. 8 times 2 is 16. This times this is minus 8 root 3. And then we have a plus 8 root 3. How about that? And then a minus 4 times 3 is minus 12. This all simplifies very nicely. This, Like I was guessing, these cancel. That's a 1. 16 minus 12 is 4. How about that? But that's not the final answer. That's x squared. So x is... Plus or minus 2? Well, it's got to be plus 2. x is plus 2. That's the final answer. Wow. Crazy. Is that really right? Let's double check it with the calculator. Let's calculate the bottom first. 2 plus square root of 3. And then take the square root of that. And then I'll take square root of 2 uh, plus square root of 6 and divide by that previous answer. Lo and behold, 2. Amazing. Number 6 says, solve each inequality 
sketch the solution set on the real number line, then the write the answer using interval notation. Part A, we've got the product of three linear terms being less than zero. To solve it, what you want to do is you want to think about, first of all, where is this thing equal to zero? This is going to be zero where x is zero, or negative one, or positive two. Mark those numbers on the number line, and then you just test numbers in these different intervals when x is less than negative one, when x is between negative one and zero, when x is between zero and two, and when x is bigger than two. Plug them in here, or think about it, and just think about whether the sign is positive or negative. When x is less than negative one, like negative two for example, that's negative, that's negative, and that's negative. You get the product of three negative numbers, that's certainly negative. It's negative. When x is in here between negative one and zero, like negative a half, this is negative, that's positive, this is negative. Negative times positive times negative is positive. We get greater than zero. When you're between zero and two, like one, that's positive, that's positive, that's negative. Positive times positive times negative is negative. And when you're bigger than two, like three, you got a positive times a positive times a positive, not negative, you get positive. So the solution set is values of x over here and here. Sketching the solution set means make it bolder. This is a strict inequality, so we do not include the endpoints. Make open circles there like that. In interval notation, the solution set over here goes from minus infinity to negative one, not including the endpoints, so I put a parenthesis there, not a square bracket. And I also go from zero to two, not including the endpoints, and I'm unioning those two sets. That would be the solution set. How is this useful? Uh, one way it's useful is if you think of this as a, a function of x, it's a cubic, it can help you think about its graph. Its graph is going to be below the axis when x is less than negative one, go above the axis between here and here, go below again, and then back up again. That's a nice, useful way to think about what's going on here. Part B, the absolute value of x minus five is less than three. Okay, there's a couple different ways you can think about this. One's geometric and one's algebraic. Whenever you have the absolute value of the difference of two numbers, it's always the distance between the numbers. This is the distance between an arbitrary number x and the number five. We are after the values of x where that distance is less than three. Just think about a number line. Here's five. What values of x are within three units of five? Between two and eight. Not including the endpoints because it's a strict inequality. You would include the endpoints if it were a less than or equal to. So graphically, the solution set looks like this. And in interval notation, it would go from two to eight. That would be the answer. How would you think about this algebraically? When the absolute value of some quantity is less than a number, in this a positive number, in this case three, that means the quantity itself, in this case x minus five, that we're taking the absolute value of is between negative three and positive three. Then we can solve this by adding five to everything so that the five cancels there. You're left with negative three plus five is two is less than x is less than three plus five is eight, and that is the same solution set. Part C, we've got a rational function of x being less than or equal to one. Uh, this is a little tricky because you really need to think about solving it in two cases because when you multiply both sides of an inequality by the same quantity, the inequality stays the same direction if the quantity you multiply by is positive, but it changes direction if it's negative. So I'm gonna multiply both sides by x plus two here, but I need to think about it in two cases, one where x plus two is positive, one where it's negative. If x plus two, the bottom of that fraction is positive, I can ignore where it equals zero because that would be dividing by zero and it would be undefined. Then I can multiply both sides by it and the inequality stays the same direction and I get three x minus four less than or equal to x plus two. Try to isolate x, subtract x from both sides, add four to both sides, then divide both sides by two, which is a positive number. Once again, the inequality stays the same direction. So I get x is less than or equal to three, three but what is this condition equivalent to? That's equivalent to x being bigger than negative two. So I, I, only in this case, 
does x being less than or equal to negative 3 work? What about the case where x plus 2 is negative? Then when I multiply both sides by x plus 2, I get 3x minus 4 is greater than or equal to x plus 2. Once again, try to isolate x, subtract x from both sides, add 4 to both sides, divide both sides by 2. In this case, I'm thinking about when x is greater than or equal to 3. But what does this inequality mean? This is equivalent to saying x is less than negative 2, which is not consistent with this inequality right there. Therefore, the final answer has got to be only based on this case right here. In inequality notation, x, negative 2 is going to be less than x is less than or equal to 3. In interval notation, that would be the open interval from negative 2 to 3, uh, where t negative 2 is not included, but 3 is included. So it's really a half open, half closed interval. On a number line, if you mark negative 2 and 3 right here, you'd put an open circle right here and a closed circle right here. What is this useful for? If you were going to graph this function as a function of x, you're really after the values of x where it's less than or equal to 1, meaning less than or equal to the line y equals 1. Let's see if this really is working. So on my calculator, I will go ahead and plug in this function. The original function was 3x minus 4, all divided by x plus 2. I'm also going to plot the, the constant function 1, so we can see both of these in the graph. Let's pick a window. Oh, let's keep this window and just see what we see. I made some kind of syntax error. What is my error here? Oh, I forgot a set of parentheses here. Insert parentheses. Okay, now let's try to graph it. So I first have the function. Where is it less than or equal to that line? Certainly over here. What happens when x is negative 2? I don't see the graph anywhere. Is it on the here somewhere? I, if I make the window bigger, I think we would see it. Let's try going negative 50 to 50 here instead. Yeah, we do see the graph over there, and it's above the line y equals 1. So yes, the inequality is only satisfied on this set that you see right here. Number 7 has got two parts. In both parts, we're finding an equation for a line with given property. Part A says passing through the point with its assumed rectangular coordinates, negative 5, comma 2, and parallel to the line with equation 3x plus 6y equals 7. Since it's parallel to this line, we want to first start by finding the slope of this line. That can be done by solving for y as a function of x. Get the line in slope intercept form. First subtract 3x from both sides, then divide both sides by 6. We get y is negative 1 half x plus 7 6 there is your slope our line is parallel to it so it's got the same slope of negative one half passing through this point i can use point slope form i can write y minus the second coordinate of this point two equals the slope negative one half times x minus the first coordinate of that point which is negative five so this becomes negative one half times x plus five that is an equation for the line, but usually you want to solve for y. You want to get it in slope-intercept form. So I'll add 2 to both sides. And I'll also distribute the minus 1 half through the parentheses here like this. Simplify 2 is the same as 4 over 2. So we get y equals negative 1 half x minus 5 halves plus 4 over 2 is minus 1 half. This is a line with a slope of negative 1 half and a y-intercept of negative 1 half. Does it really pass through that point? We might want to double check it. If you replace x with negative 5, negative 1 half times negative 5 is positive 5 halves, minus 1 half is 4 halves, which is 2. It does go through the right point. This line looks about like uh, this, negative 5, 2, slope of negative 1, 1 half. It looks about like this is the line that we're after in part A. Part B. The line's got an x-intercept of negative 8 and a y-intercept of 24. Um, the y-intercept is 24 and the slope is unknown. We could write it as y equals mx plus 24. And we've got to solve for the slope by using the fact that the x-intercept is negative 8. The x-intercept is where it crosses the horizontal axis where y is 0. I can plug in y equals 0 and uh, plug in x equals negative 8 and solve for m. We'll get uh, 8m equals 24 and that means m is 3. 
So y equals 3x plus 24 is the slope intercept form of the answer. Number eight, we've got two points, p with coordinates negative three, negative four, and q with coordinates two, eight. There are two points in the plane, and we've got various things to do. Part A says find the length of the line segment. Let's draw a quick picture to get a feel for what's going on here. Negative three, negative four is a point right about there. That's P. Q is two, eight. That would be right around here. There's Q. We're trying to find the length of this line segment. It's an application of the Pythagorean theorem. We can draw a right triangle in here. We can think about the fact that the hypotenuse squared equals this side squared plus this side squared. You can also think of it as the distance formula. In the end, you get the square root of the difference of the x coordinates squared, negative three minus two squared, plus the difference of the y coordinates squared, negative four minus eight squared. This distance right there is five. That's the absolute value of negative three minus, ne minus two. And this distance right there is 12. That's the absolute value of negative four minus eight. In the end, you get negative five squared is 25. 12 squared is 144. This is square root of 169, which does turn out to be a nice number, 13. What is the midpoint of the line segment? You, the quickest way to find that is just to average the coordinates, okay? Take the coordinates of these things. What are the coordinates of the midpoint? Average them, negative three and two. What do they average out to? Add them up and divide by two. Negative four and eight, they average out to their sum divided by two as well. So the coordinates, when you simplify, give you negative one half and four over two is two. That is the midpoint. You could see in the picture, it's going to be uh, right around here. It's not drawn perfectly. Uh, this line is actually a little higher evidently because it's not drawn perfectly. Part C, find an equation of the line that passes through the points P and Q. So we've got two points. The first thing to do is find the slope, okay? Maybe I should have called this mid for midpoint because I usually want to reserve M for the slope. M, the slope is rise over run, sometimes written change in Y over change in X. This triangle symbol is the Greek letter delta. This is delta y over delta x, standard notation for change in. You can see from the picture, it's gonna be 12 over five, okay? You could also think of it in terms of eight minus negative four being 12, and also two, uh, two minus negative three being five. That is the slope uh, in decimal form. That would be 2.4 if you prefer. We need uh, a point. You can use either P or Q. I'll use Q because you got positive numbers there, but when you solve for the slope intercept form, you should get the same answer in the end. The y coordinate of q is eight. The slope here is 12 fifths. The x coordinate of q is two. Expand this out, I get 12 fifths x minus 24 fifths. Add eight to both sides. Eight is uh, 40 over five. 40 minus 24 is 16. So I get y is 12 fifths x uh, plus 16 over five, or if you prefer, this is 2.4x plus 3.2. The slope is 2.4 and the y-intercept is 3.2. Yeah, that's a little higher than two. Again, this picture is not perfect. Part D, find an equation of the perpendicular bisector of PQ. So it's gonna be a line that's perpendicular to PQ. We need a slope, we need a point. Okay, the point's gonna come from the midpoint a bisector, it's going through the midpoint. What about the, the slope? The slope is going to be what's called the negative reciprocal of the original slope. The original slope is 12 fifths. The new slope of this new line that's perpendicular to the original is found by taking the reciprocal of that and putting a negative sign in front of it. It's negative 5 twelfths. That's something to just know, okay? Um, I want the equation of the line, so I also need a point. I'm going to use the midpoint here. So I'll get y minus 2 is negative five twelfths times x minus negative one half. Distribute the negative five twelfths through the parentheses. I get negative five twelfths x. I got a plus one half there, so I get a minus five twenty-fourths. Add two to both sides, which is 48 over 24. I get y equals negative five twelfths x. 48 
minus 5 is 43 over 24. Uh, yeah, double check this. Okay, we could get a common denominator of 24, but it's not a big deal. That would be the equation of the perpendicular bisector. Finally, part E, find an equation of the circle for which PQ is the diameter. So now in this picture, this is going to be the diameter. The midpoint is going to be the center of the circle. We want an equation for this circle. Uh, the key thing is what it's is going to be its radius. Um, because the point that it's centered at is at the midpoint. So the form of the equation is going to be x minus the first coordinate of the midpoint is negative 1 half quantity squared. And then it's going to be y minus the second coordinate of the midpoint, which is 2 quantity squared. What We need the radius, actually. What is the radius? That's got to be what's squared over here for the equation of a circle. Well, the length of the diameter is 13, so the radius is half of that, 13 over 2. So this is going to be 13 over 2 squared, which would be 169 over 4. That is an answer. Should we simplify it? We, we could. This is x plus 1 half. Quantity squared is going to be x squared plus uh, 1 half plus 1 half is 1, so I get an x. 1 half times 1 half is 1 fourth. Continuing to do some quick foiling in my head and simplifying 169 over 4. That is another form of the equation of the circle. I could also multiply everything by 4 to get rid of the fractions. 4x squared plus 4x plus 1 plus 4y squared minus 16y plus 16 equals 169. And maybe we want to get all the constants on the right side for good measure. 4x squared plus 4x plus 4y squared minus 16y. 1 plus 16 is 17. i got to subtract 17 from both sides equals 152. If I've not made a mistake, this should be the equation of the circle for which PQ is the diameter. We're almost done. Just two more problems. In 9, we got two parts where we're sketching the graph of an equation. Part A x equals y squared minus 4. This is tricky. It wouldn't be so hard if it were y equals x squared minus 4. That graph would be a parabola opening upward and would have a y-intercept at negative 4. But wait a minute, the x and y's are switched around. What do you do? Well, you could quote-unquote cheat and change the labeling for the axes. You could call that y and that x, but usually you don't want to do that. We want to stay consistent with the usual label labeling. What you want to do is you want to think of x as a function of y instead of y as a function of x. You could plot points. You could plug in different things for y, find the corresponding x, and then as far as plotting them goes, you'd want to convert it to the usual order. Pick some different things for y, like negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. Square them, subtract 4 to find the corresponding value of x, because x is a function of y. Negative 3 squared is 9, minus 4 is 5, same with 3 squared minus 4. Negative 2 squared is 4, minus 4 is 0, same with 2 squared minus 4. Negative 1 squared is 1, minus 4 is negative 3. And then 0 squared is 0, minus 4 is negative 4. The corresponding points with the usual ordering of their coordinates, you've got to just flip these around, give you this. So you'd want to plot those points. And what are you going to get? You're going to get a, get a sideways parabola instead of an ordinary looking parabola. Um, let's see here. The x-intercept is going to be negative 4. That corresponds to this point when x is negative 4, y is 0. The y-intercepts are going to be when x is 0, they're going to be at y equals 2, negative 2 and y equals positive 2. Here's positive 2, here's negative 2. It's, yeah, it's going to be a sideways parabola. You might say, hey, it, it fails the vertical line test. There are vertical lines that go through it more than once. Well, that, the reason that happens is because y is a function of x here instead of, excuse me, x is a function of y instead of y being a function of x. It does pass the horizontal line test for such a sideways graph, okay? That is allowed. Maybe you've never thought about that before, but that is allowed. Part B is a problem where we're going to complete the square. We want to graph this equation perhaps the graph is going to be the graph of a circle. Group together the x terms, first of all. Group together the y terms. 
and put the constant over on the other side. Then complete the square for both the x's and y's individually. How do you complete the square? Well, it's easiest when the coefficients of the square terms are 1, as they are here. What you do is you take the constant, the uh, linear term, its coefficient, divide it by 2 and square it. Negative 8 divided by 2 is negative 4. Negative 4 squared is positive 16. Put that in there. Huh? Put it in there? Why is that okay? I, I'm coming back to that. Do the same kind of thing for the y terms. Take the coefficient of y, 6. Divide it by 2, 3. Square that, get 9. Put it in there. That doesn't seem like it should be allowed. Well, it is as long as you compensate by doing it on the other side as well. So I added a 16 there and a 9 there, so I do the same thing here. Simplify, that simplifies to 9. These are now perfect squares. That's why that trick is a good thing to do. This thing is x minus 4 quantity squared. This thing is y plus 3 quantity squared. And 9 is 3 squared. This is a circle of radius 3 centered at the point 4, negative 3 x is 4, y equals negative 3, that's the center of the circle, the radius is 3, so it goes through this point here, and a point right about there, and yeah, you could be careful here to try to draw this accurately, something about like this, <laughs> not very good at drawing it here, is your circle centered at the point 4, negative 3, with a radius of 3. It's our last problem, number 10. Uh-oh, it's a word problem. Well, just take a deep breath. You can do it. Ashley paints three times as fast as Brian and two times as fast as Carl. Ashley paints faster, but it takes them 120 minutes to paint a room when all three are working together. The question is, how long would it take Ashley if she works alone? Okay, so that length of time, that is the unknown. Let's call that X. X is the time for Ashley to paint the room. To paint the room. If she works alone, I'm not gonna bother writing that. Most natural units to use would be minutes since it's given that they can paint it in 120 minutes when they work together. This is in minutes. Based on this, we can figure out how long it's gonna take Brian and Carl. Ashley paints three times as fast, it takes her less time. If it takes Ashley X minutes to paint the room, it's going to take Brian three times X to paint the room. So for example, if Ashley paints the room in 200 minutes, say, it would take Brian 600 minutes. You could convert these things to hours, but we won't bother doing so. So this is time for Brian to paint the room in minutes. And she works two times as fast as Carl, so it takes Carl two X minutes. That's the time for Carl to paint the room once again in minutes. Okay, so, but, so that's the background. The, these are the variables. Ultimately, we want to solve for X, but how do we get an equation to solve for X? What you want to do is you want to take these times and convert them to painting rates. If, for example, Let's think in hours. If it took Ashley four hours to paint the room, which would be 240 minutes, that would mean she could paint one-fourth of the room every hour. The reciprocal of four is one-fourth. Likewise, if it takes Ashley X minutes to paint the room, one over X, the reciprocal of X, would be the painting rate for Ashley. Painting rate for Ashley what would the units be? Would it be 1 over minutes? Well, technically, yes, if x is in minutes, but it's going to be easier to think of it in terms of the amount of the room every minute. This is rooms per minute. Technically, the um, units up here don't have to be thought of as in minutes. They could be thought of as in minutes per room. Okay, again, if Ashley takes 200 or 240 minutes, that's how many minutes it takes her to paint the room. So this is in rooms per minute. If x is 200, this would be 1 200th. One half of 1% of the room gets painted every minute. The reciprocals of 3x and 2x would be the painting rates for Brian and Carl, respectively. 1 over 3x, that's the painting rate for Brian, also in rooms per minute. And 1 over 2x, that's the painting rate 
for Carl also in rooms per minute. When they all work together, the painting rates get added. So the sum of these reciprocals, one over x plus one over three x plus one over two x would be the combined painting rate. This is the combined painting rate in rooms per minute. And since we're given that it takes them 120 minutes to paint the room when they work together, this would have to be one over 120. And there's the equation that you can solve for x. Now you can go ahead and get a common denominator here of 6x to help you solve it. You also can get rid of the fractions completely by multiplying everything by 6x. Let's go ahead and do that. 6x times 1 over x, the x's will cancel leaving you with 6. 6x times 1 over 3x, 3x cancels with 6x to leave you with a 2. And 6x times 1 over 2x, the x's cancel and the 2's cancel, leaving you with a 3 because 6 is 2 times 3. If I multiply this thing by 6x, I get 6x over 120, which simplifies down to, six, to x over 20. 6 plus 2 plus 3 is 11. To solve for x, all I have to do is multiply both sides by 20. x is 20 times 11 which is going to be 220 minutes. That is the answer to the question because the question was how long will it take Ashley if she works alone? 220 minutes, that would be three hours and 40 minutes. You may wanna double check this. Maybe you wanna just quickly double check that when you plug it in this equation that you get the right thing. Uh, when x is 220, the first fraction is one over 220, then one over 660 and a one over 440, does that equal in the end one over 120, it's not so clear. You'd wanna get a common denominator as one way to do it. Uh, a common denominator you could use would be 660 times, um, times, what would it be, two I believe, 660 times two, that would be 1320, that should be a common denominator. 13, uh, how much does 220 go into 1320? Divide this by, 220, you get six. One over 220 is the same as six over 1320. Uh, I multiplied 660 by two to get 1320, so one over 660 is two over 1320. And yes, 1320 divided by 440 is a whole number as well, it's three. This gives you three over 1320 as the same as one over 440. Add those together, this is not surprising, you get 11 over 1320, and that is the same as one over 120. 1320 divided by 11 is 120 and therefore 11 over 1320 is 1 over 120 and it checks out. Thanks for watching.